Okay, then I'm going to call um, today's meeting to order. And, um, the first item, the item on the agenda will be um, the executive director's report. And while Susan's giving that executive director's report, if everybody could just finish uh, going through the minutes from uh, the 13th, that would be helpful. Um, so executive director Barrett. Okay, I will try to speak slowly so folks can read. So, um, no, I, I just have a few announcements. First, as I mentioned uh, last week, um, tonight we are going to be hosting our primary care advisory group that is obviously going to be virtual, and the call-in number is on our um, website under our press release. And, Abigail, is that number listed on um Right on the top of, right under the press release, I believe it is, right? Under for today's date for the call-in for the PCAG. We just want to make sure folks yeah, have it's that. It's on the press release. Yeah. Perfect. Please reach out if members from the public are um, interested and uh, have a hard time finding that number, but it is very clear on our press release. Um, I also just want to say that we did receive some public comment regarding the hospital budget guidance. Um, we did post that as well with our materials for today's meeting, and um, it's likely we will be extending that um, public comment period. That will be part of Patrick's um, presentation today. Uh, so uh, please look at our website uh, to provide any other um, – to, to find out where to um, – submit additional public comments after today's meeting if ne necessary. And um, for next week's meeting, I think we'll have more clarity after today's meeting, but it's probably likely we'll continue this discussion on hospital budgets. So stay tuned for an, an uh, updated uh, schedule on our website. And that is all I have to report out, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. Is there a motion on the minutes of Wednesday, May 13th? So moved. So moved. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, May 13th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. So at this time, I'm going to call the last four digits of the phone numbers that we do not have the names attached to on the um, participants list so that Abigail can keep an accurate record of who was at the meeting. So I'm going to start with 5001. That's Julia Shaw with the Health Care Advocate. Thank you, Julia. 8913. This is Lori Gianturco, G-I-A-N-T-U-R-C-O. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. 8703. Mike Del Treco. Thank you, Mike. 2505. Jennifer Collis, UVM Medical Center. Thank you, Jennifer. 6376. Mort Wasserman. Thank you, Mort. 7438. Ham Davis. Thank you, Ham. 0043. Becky Lewandowski from DRM. Thank you, Becky. 2636. Howard Weiss Tisman, Vermont Public Radio. Thank you, Howard. 8878. Jen Bertrand, Porter Medical Center. Thank you, Jen. 5058. Hi, Susan Gretkowski, MVP. Thank you, Susan. 5835. That's Abigail. Nope, sorry, Abigail. <laughs> You'd think I'd recognize that by now. Okay, 1042. Robin Alvis, NMC, CFO. Welcome, Robin. 8823. That's Stephanie Brill from NMC. Hi, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Okay, 7,000. Dan Bennett from Gifford. Okay, Dan. Um, 7520. Bob Hersey from NVRH. Hi, Bob. Morning. Good afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Goes by fast when the sun's shining out there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it does. 1970. Eight two eight nineteen seventy. This is Janine. I'm recording at one forty four. Thank you. <laughs> Three two one two. Hi, it's Kathy Mahoney from the advisory committee. Thank you, Kathy. Two zero seven nine. Nick Sherman, Leonine Public Affairs. Welcome, Nick. 2079. That's me, Nick. Oh, 3452. It's Rebecca Coban just across the ship. Okay, I think that I have everybody else's name. Is there anybody whose number I did not call? Yes, this is Don Bugby, 8887 Northwestern Medical Center. Thank you, Don. Anyone else? Uh, this is Susan Aronoff from um, the DD Council. Yeah, Eight you're in the zero. system, Susan, so your name does come up, fortunately. Okay, I didn't hear it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. So thank you, everyone. And... Um, the purpose of this afternoon's meeting is to discuss um, hospital budget guidance for 2021. And um, before I get started, if anyone has any loud cats like Robin or um, any other distracting noises, if you could put yourself on mute, um, that would be good. If during the presentation, if there are distractions from, from something other than the presenter, then what I will do is I will mute the whole conversation so the presenter will have to unmute themselves um, so that uh, um, they can keep coming through. Um, but we just want to be able to um, have a, a, a clear audio of whatever is being talked about or presented this afternoon. So this is um, has been an ongoing discussion on what is the um, proper guidance to give for hospital budgets um, for the 2021 year, given the, the way the world was turned upside down by COVID-19. And we've made some progress. And at the last meeting, um, we um, talked about a number of items, including um, what the proper guidance is, what the proper enforcement would be, what the um, guidance for a change of charge might look like. And um, just to tee it up before I turn it over to Patrick, as you recall, um, we did not settle on um, any clear path on what enforcement could be. Um, what I had proposed as a change to the guidance that had been circulated was um, that we took the total um, budget allowance for 20 and then added three and a half percent onto that. Um, and then, so for example, if a hospital made an even hundred million dollars in NPR, um, that's what they were given for their approved budget in 20, um, we would tack three and a half percent onto that and their enforcement would be based only if they went above 203 million 500 thousand, and um, we did not have any um, conclusion to that discussion, and I'm just uh, saying that those are the type of decisions that we will have to lock down at some point. It could be today, but it could be in the future, and we are not going to have a final vote on uh, the budget guidance today, so that hospitals and others will have a chance for public comment um, before we do. So if you remember at last week's meeting, we charged the hospital finance team to work with a couple of board members to come up with some 
possible options for what the um, guidance might be for a change in charge. And again, just to uh, throw out an example that I had thrown out in the past, and again, this is just one board member, so it means absolutely nothing. But for an example, um, I had suggested that um, after listening to board member Lunge talk about a two-part uh, rate that I thought it was a brilliant idea and that I was suggesting that we have one part of the change in charge that's more clearly linked to what the historic change in charge has been. And um, I asked the uh, team to come up with what the five-year CAGR has been for the change in charge for the last five years. And that's come out to about 2.8%. So I'm thinking that, um, at least in my mind, I'd like to see a base change in charge around 3%. But again, that's just a suggestion and no decisions have been made. Um, but in addition to that, a second component that would be temporary, and um, that would be based upon uh, the drop in commercial revenue that the hospitals saw because of COVID and give them an opportunity to get back on firm financial footing. And for those that say, well, what are you trying to do as far as rates? I would say that we're not trying to um, have a whipsaw in the, the rates that people would pay through insurance because keep in mind um, what we're talking about Whenever you talk about the expenditures of a system, it's not just price, it's also utilization. And what COVID did was drop that utilization down considerably. So in order to get the hospitals back on financial footing, what we're really considering is giving them a chance to meet that pent up demand over a period of time, which would be tempered not only by a hospital's ability to meet pent up demand because of their staffing uh, resources and their physical plant resources, but also to um, deal with the fact that some people might be afraid and may not be willing to come out quickly to um, meet any of that pent up demand. So all of that is just a long way of saying that um, we've got a lot of decisions to make um, on the guidance, but I see the change in charge as being a very significant discussion and I see the um, enforcement as being a significant discussion. And I just also want to acknowledge the fact that the board received a letter from Vaz this morning asking that um, the budget process be delayed even further and possibly consider not having a budget process for 21. So that has to be one of the options that's out there. And I would say that we have to consider all options and then come to um, what we think is best for the state of Vermont as far as consumers and also as far as making our hospitals financially healthy because consumers don't benefit if they don't have a healthy healthcare system. So with that, Patrick, a very long introduction, but I'm turning it over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. It dovetails well into our conversation. And now you can share your screen. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to make sure I get this into reading view for everyone today, as I did not do that last week. So it's probably a little hard for people to see. OK. Can everyone see my screen and hear me? So I cannot see your screen yet. Does anybody see his screen yet? I think it's loading. I, I don't see it yet either. It's coming. Okay, I got it now, Patrick. <laughs> okay, good. And also, if for any reason I break up <clears throat> on the regular while I'm talking, please let me know and I will phone in. We had some construction here last week, and I think it caused a little interference with um, my presentation. So if that occurs again, please stop me and I will call in um, and remove my discussion from our internet bandwidth and move it over to the telephone line. So uh, thank you very much. prepared to... Um, share her screen with the slides if that occurs? I think she is now. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, here we are, um, part two of our um, abbreviated guidance discussion. Welcome. Um, 
We're going to move right into some of the aspects from last week's meeting that we will update you on as we go through. Um, primarily was the board's direction, as Kevin mentioned to staff, uh, to come up with an option or options recognizing um, a potentially separate COVID rate on the change in charge item. Uh, in addition to that, <clears throat> we also had uh, board member Holmes and board member Yusufer ask if we would place into the guidance um, narrative a component that asks the hospitals to discuss service line adjustments and risks and opportunities. And on slide three at the very bottom, uh, you can see that we've added those into the guidance. And above that is the slide from the prior week uh, with some of the items that we've considered in the abbreviated guidance thus far. So just to cover those steps real quickly, um, that's where we are going into this discussion today. So as Kevin mentioned, <clears throat> the board did ask us to come up with some options around um, potentially a bifurcated change in charge or some alternative uh, given the complexities that COVID, COVID has brought upon our hospitals. And we put a lot of work into trying to standardize some options over the last couple of days. And we ultimately came back to the same uh, items over and over again in that the situation continues to be extremely fluid. The details uh, from the hospital side uh, are numerous and, and therefore a standardized option was not something that we were going to be able to get to because there's, there's so much that goes into um, the change in charge discussion. There's a lot of unknowns that go into that too, as we've stated, utilization is unknown. How long is it going to take the hospital to uh, recover from COVID related financial impacts, et cetera. So we couldn't really get to a standardized, standardized option within the work group um, that we put together. So <clears throat> what we've done is we've put together a list of some recommended assumptions that the board may want to include in a discussion today around the change in charge piece. And that is, um, as has been alluded to, having the hospitals come in with a regular change in charge increase, which is already built into the guidance, but also adding to that a COVID-19 related charge increase, but let the hospitals um, discuss the assumptions um, and with consideration given to loss of commercial revenue in, in fiscal year 20, loss of utilization in fiscal year 20, um, what percentage of that utilization do they anticipate on recapturing in fiscal year 21? Uh, what amount of stimulus funds have they received to date? What could possibly come in the future? Um, as we all know, these submissions will be in late July and with a fluid situation, as we've mentioned, there can be more, there could possibly be more federal stimulus monies coming down <clears throat> as the situation evolves, uh, moving into the early part and middle part of summer. And also where the hospitals see Medicare and Medicaid fitting into this equation and what will be known going into um, June and the early part of July as they begin to put together um, these budgets and find out where the COVID impact shortfall is, how long it's going to last, et cetera. So those are some um, assumptions that we believe the board should consider. That doesn't mean it should be limited to that. Um, certainly whatever the hospitals um, come to the budget discussion with next year, um, they will have to describe in detail what their assumptions are as of that point in time. And with the fluid of this situation, we know that that's gonna be difficult and also um, can change rapidly. So we wanted the hospitals to have the emphasis on this instead of trying to create some sort of standardized model that may not do justice to the entirety of the situation. Um, additionally, <clears throat> with a change in charge proposal, the board may also want to consider the hospital's current financial situation, the solvency, what expense reduction plans that they have, and long-term strategic and financial plans for sustainability. And sustainability is not just the phrase of the day in the healthcare world right now, but around the country as COVID has um, not discriminated against its impact on the, the economy of the United States. So, you know, building that into the discussion is also very important moving into this budget cycle and into the uh, next fiscal year. Um, also considering ensure information regarding actual and projected utilization and price changes, impact on Vermonters and employers in the commercial market, and any other relevant factors that the board may want to consider uh, within this guidance. <clears throat> so to provide an example, 
probably on more of a worst case situation is what the hospitals may be looking at um, and what the board may have to consider with these very difficult decisions is what, what could the potential COVID impact be on NPR moving from <clears throat> the latter half of March and April through September. And like I said, this is a worst case scenario. It's simply an illustration. But looking down at the bottom of slide six, um, there's the potential that in the latter half of the year, um, there could be some major NPR shortfalls coming in. And that right there does not consider any stimulus grant monies that the hospital will have received. So taking a look at the situation as it stands related to that patient revenue, and then na navigating to slide seven <laughs> and seeing according to the hospital's payer mix history where that money would trickle down into its various payer silos. Then you add back in the stimulus grants to find in the lower right-hand corner post-stimulus allocation um, NPR revenue gap. And it is within there that we would think the hospitals could begin to build that COVID <clears throat> um, temporary commercial increase to try to get themselves um, as close back to normal considering utilization and other assumptions that need to go into it, and also discussing with the board, what's your time frame to get back to uh, where you were? So this highlights the fluidity of it. It highlights the fact that the board is gonna have to make some very tough decisions, um, but it's trying to consider as many factors at this current time as possible in relation to um, how, how to make the best uh, effort possible in coming forth with a COVID-related charge increase on the commercial side. So <clears throat> continuing on to slide eight, these are some of the high level items that Kevin alluded to earlier that still need to be worked out. Um, the guidance continues on with this discussion, um, but the big piece here is the change in charge and, and how the board wants to treat that. So backing up into those um, assumptions that we've put forward for consideration, the hospitals would have to come forward with those um, as they bring their budget to <clears throat> the board for hearings. Also, the NPR growth target, we, we left that uh, uh, tabled last week, and the enforcement policy, as we discussed earlier, and also the matter of the um, budget guidance timeline. We had moved the submission date to the 31st, and that's proposed. That has not been voted on in any sense yet. Um, and during the last week, the HCA sent over some uh, comments and guidance questions, and the first was that uh, guidance language should be added. They proposed guidance language should be added around COVID-19 funds that have been received and the use of those funds and any requirements tied to them. So the board need to consider um, acceptance of that into the budget guidance. And then their questions <clears throat> included a fiscal year 20 and 21 commercial rate chart that they sent to us by payer, uh, financial assistance information during COVID and provider recruitment with the federal J1V J1 visa waiver program. <clears throat> and those documents, I believe, have been posted to our to our website upon receipt. Um, additionally, as Susan alluded to earlier, um, keeping the public comment period open until May 26, which I believe is next Tuesday, following the Monday holiday at 10 a.m., um, a potential board vote next Wednesday on the 27th, and following any vote, whether it's next Wednesday or um, next Friday, um, distribute the guidance to hospitals and post the information to our website. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Um, I'll open it back up to the board. And if you would like me to toggle back to any of the slides, I am happy to do so. So just to let the know, um, Patrick talked about um, a possible vote on the 27th in, or the 29th. Um, just let the public know that we haven't scheduled the 29th yet but it will depend on how things are going today and through the public comment period. Um, I've asked all board members to set aside the time on the 29th so that if we're not able to um, finalize things on the 27th, we could come back to it on the 29th um, in a way to try to give hospitals as much time between when this is finalized and when they have to submit on July 31st um, as possible. So with that, I'll open it up to board members for questions of Patrick. Did I lose everyone? 
No, this is Maureen. Um, I'll start off uh, with a couple of comments. Um, Patrick, maybe if you could go back to the slide where it, it kind of builds the components that could go into the rate increase. I think it's the one before that. Um, the one before that, actually. Okay. Um, uh, no, you passed it. Sorry. Just it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess a, uh, just a couple things um, I also think could be in consideration here. Um, one is um, the time frame. So, you know, what is the time frame that um, a hospital is looking at to kind of get back to um, their historical, I guess, financial metrics? And, um, you know, there's different ways that could be, right? So one option is that it's it's really over a multi-year period. You know, um, this year was primarily impacted six months. Um, and then, you know, going into 21 and 22, I'm not sure if the expectation would be that they would be able to recoup everything in one year. Um, it could be over a two-year period. Um, could be over a one-year period. I mean, that, that's something the board could discuss about what the expectation might be, because we know, of course, this assumes um, that that COVID is not having additional impacts, which it certainly could. Um, so, I, so I would put time frame out there as a potential thing to look at. Look at. Um, also, on the you know the next page where you talked about considerations, you know another consideration. Um, that the hospitals will be going through will, will kind of be, are there going to be any permanent structural changes? Um, is telemedicine going to become, you know, part of um, w what we move forward with? Not, not everything continuing at the full force telemedicine as it is now, but will that be a component in the future? And if so, you know, what are the reimbursement? What's the cost um, for, for hospitals to do that? Are there benefits? Um, so and, you know, that's just one example, but there may be kind of structural changes that occur from this, um, you know, as well as I know we've talked a little bit about confidence of um, patients coming back in the hospital. So who knows, will we ever regain the levels where we were before um, at a steady state? And if not, that would also, you know, need to consider some structural changes, not necessarily reliance on fixing it all with a with a commercial um, you know insurance change. Um, and then I'm not sure if we explicitly put in here, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with reimbursement with Medicaid and Medicare, you know, the other payers or um, if the stimulus funds don't make up the gap that they that was created there, um, will there, you know, will there be price increases that will carry for those payers that will help alleviate that in the future? Um, so those were just a few things that I think we should also be, you know, considering. Um, and then if you move to the next page, you know, I think you brought up here, you know, of course, expense reduction plans, you know, anything that can help um, the hospital get back to where they were financially and um, offset, you know, reliance solely on, on rate increases, you know, will be looked upon as well. Um, because you know, I think we also have to factor in any large rate increases uh, for the COVID piece. I don't know if you explicitly wrote on this as well, that they would expect it to be temporary. So whether that was going to be a one year or as I brought up, possibly a multi-year um, where maybe the increase isn't as large, but carries for a couple of years, but eventually we would expect, or I believe the board would expect that that would go away um, because as we're thinking about this, we also need to think about 
what is the impact on the insurance companies um, because we, you know, there's one expectation that that there's going to be a surplus created from this, and so how does that roll through? But that hasn't been proven out that there is is a surplus. And then just you know, one final point I'll make out make on um, um, you know, this is an extreme example, but if um, if a hospital was was down 25% in volume. Um, as, as the example you showed this year, because they were down, you know, basically 50% off for half of the year. If that all does come back next year, and that, that's a, obviously a big assumption, you wouldn't need a rate increase to fill the gap because you, you really would just be shifting a big loss in this current year to a big gain in the future year. And, and um, that's why it's going to be so important to really – have a good estimate on what we think what they think utilization increase will be next year. And again, that was an extreme. I don't think they're going to make all of it up, but I believe the expectation is that some of that will come back, and that puts less pressure on having to recoup everything with a commercial rate change only. So um, those are just some thoughts for people to think about. Thanks. Kevin, you're muted. Well, thank you, Rob. <laughs> um, I was I was trying to figure out where that feedback was coming from. It clearly wasn't from my end, but um, I was getting feedback when Maureen was talking. Um, I just wanted to say that um, Maureen's brought up some really great points, and what I think we've learned already is that each hospital is going to be unique. So, for example. Um, during regular monitoring calls, um, Patrick and Lori and I learned, for example, that at one of our smallest hospitals, that um, they're seeing um, most of their um, numbers coming back to a more normal rate. They're not at 100 percent, but um, they weren't hit as hard as when you talk to people like at UVM or Rutland or other hospitals like that. So each hospital is going to be different, and I think that the sec second part of um, the change in charge, uh, which is the temporary change in charge part, um, really will be determined by the individual hospital um, based on what they see, because also each hospital is going to have a different ability to meet if there is pent-up demand. Um, they're going to be limited by the members of their staff by their physical plant um, so that where one hospital might be able to immediately meet pent-up de demand, it might take another hospital more than the 12-month period to meet that demand. So I think that um, what I would see this as a temporary one-year increase on that second part, but the board would have to have a discussion um, as we go forward, if there was a second wave or if there was clear evidence that people were staying out of um, medical care because of fear, um, that we might have to revisit and have um, the same opportunity for some hospitals next year to have that second component. But I'm hoping that um, for the purposes of this year's guidance, it's really a, a one-year temporary change. That's the second piece. And that's my thought on, on that one. Um, questions or comments for Patrick? So this is Tom. Uh, and there is feedback there somewhere. Somebody's got a mic open. Um, my thinking on this is uh, this summer period could be very, uh, is going to be very important to hospitals. and. Uh, there's, and so the issue is for hospital staff, administrative staff, where, where do they spend their limited time? And I think that we're on the right path of trying to find a very streamlined approach uh, to relating to the hospitals in terms of their 2021 budget uh, because there are so many unknowns. And a couple that 
you know, obviously we've mentioned Medicaid. We don't know how Medicaid will fit into this um, in the 2021 20, uh, period. But I, I do know that Steve Klein from the Joint Fiscal Office um, yesterday, I think, uh, <clears throat> basically told folks in the legislature that um, of the $1.25 billion that has the small state minimum granted, uh, been granted to Vermont, one billion um, of it is, quote, unappropriated and unspent. Um, Adam Gresham in presentations to the legislature uh, added up all the CARES Act money, CARES 1, the CARES Act and COVID-2 money, and uh, totaled it to $1.59 billion. Um, but on the expense side, um, and this includes what had been expended through May 6th, and projected forward was only $166 million. So from a hospital's perspective, you know, they, I think, um, uh, need to be, have the time to be on that playing field uh, to leverage as best they can uh, any available resources from the federal government to their best advantage. Um, so that's one thing that I, you know, I'm sensitive to that that those issues of 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 how to apply money available to the state that is not state money but federal money haven't been resolved yet, and it will take time on task, you know, for for the for the folks at Boz and and folks at individual hospitals to make sure that uh, they're being treated fairly in that process, um, independent of of the money they're getting directly, but um, having to do with this one point, this small state uh, grant. Um, another issue is um, I'm, I'm very concerned that we don't exit this process in 2021-22 with some zombie hospitals. You know, hospitals that, um, you know, we, we know uh, going through 2019, that there were uh, seven hospitals that had the negative operating margin. In 2018, there were eight hospitals um, that had negative operating margins. And so it's really important for us to kind of, you know, appreciate that every hospital um, has its independent uh, characteristics, which is true, but also as a collective, uh, some hospitals have more advantage than others in terms of issues like you know, uh, payer mix or issues like negotiating power because of size, uh, et cetera. So um, our process, I think, has to be sensitive to trying to level the playing field. At least I, I don't believe the existing coming into this, that the existing playing field is a level one in terms of uh, payer mix, uh, case, um, you know, uh, the cost shift, um, and the scale of some hospitals relative to the, to the scale of others. Um, so that's, so the, uh, the, a big outcome in my view is that as we exit this period, that every hospital um, be uh, on a solvency track or be solvent you know, when we arrive in 2020, 2022. Um, and uh, if, if we can achieve that, um, I think that would be a major accomplishment. So the only thing I would add to uh, your comments, Tom, is that it would, uh, um, I agree with you, except with the one caveat that um, a hospital shouldn't be made whole just because of the fact that um, there was COVID-19. Um, they have to demonstrate that they are properly managing their hospital towards sustainability. And um, so I, I just don't want anybody to think that there's going to be a free windfall that's going to be on the backs of commercial ratepayers in Vermont. Kevin, I fully agree with that. I, I just, I hark back to, uh, you know, a bit of history in my life where um, in the recession in 1990, uh, Governor Snelling went to the legislature and asked them for tax increases, but tax increases that had sunset. And then uh, Dean, who accepted the uh, the, the uh, um, criteria that Snelling had had laid down, 
uh, came in and kept the state its base spending on a sustainable level. I mean, in 91, 92, 93, we went negative a couple of years in order to make sure that that we, that we didn't take those extra taxes and grow the and, and grow the state budget. So I, I do absolutely agree with you that there's got to be some factor in this process that is a benchmark that we want to achieve. And you know, last last week uh, when we discussed this, I was talking about a cap. You know, but with a very small C and very moderate, if any, uh, enforcement associated with it. Um, and, you know, I would feel that if we get through into the 2022 period, um, that, and uh, all of the hospitals are reasonably solvent, um, that uh, that will be uh, an achievement. And, um, but we do have to get there, uh, in, in a, in a way that respects the long term statistics that we drive this bus with, which is the three and a half percent. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, just want to make sure that uh, Robin or Jess have a chance to ask Patrick any questions. If you don't have questions or comments, then I'll try to create a framework where we could start to move towards um, some tentative decisions, um, starting with some of the easier ones first and then going from there. So. Um, Jess or Robin, did you have any questions or comments on Patrick's presentation? I have a couple quick comments, but Robin, do you want to go first or? You go ahead. Okay. Um, so I just want to say just in general, uh, I support, I think, as I said last week, the abbreviated guidance. Um, and I appreciate, thank you, Patrick, for adding to the narrative, the service line, any service line changes and risks and opportunities. I think those were good additions and not too hopefully onerous. Uh, again, I support the moving back the deadline. I thought the HCA's questions and uh, requests for more reporting on how the COVID funds were spent were good ones. So I would I would like to see those added. Um, and in general, I do support this concept of a temporary COVID adjustment that sunsets over some period of time. Uh, one question I had for you, Patrick, was whether or not you thought it was possible to adjust that mid-year. So let's just say that a hospital is really bringing back their revenue uh, through utilization more quickly than anticipated. Could that be adjusted downward? Or another hospital that's, you know, really not seeing the volume come back, could that be, I mean, we always do mid-year upward adjustments. We don't usually do mid-year downward adjustments. So wondered what your thoughts were on mid-year adjustments to the temporary uh, COVID charge. Um, and then I, I guess I would say I would echo that I think these have to be, if it is put in there, it has to be tied to commercial losses and it should factor in any federal and state grants. It should factor in any increased reimbursements that we're seeing from Medicare and Medicaid to uh, ensure hospital sustainability as those are the other two big payers and they may be doing some, making some efforts here to, to help our hospitals out. Um, I appreciated Maureen's comments about the discussion of the time period. So I think, you know, it's no, as I always say, these not, these hospitals are not one size fits all. So I think how this manifests itself may be different for each hospitals. I would like to see an analysis from the hospitals on the impact of their commercial charge increase on what they foresee as changes in bad debt and free care. Um, because I do think an increase in commercial charge will have an impact there. And I think it's important for us to understand what that might look like. Uh, and I guess, so I, and I would just, and I, I'll give you a chance to answer my one question about the mid year adjustment, but I just, I would say from Tom's point, I do think we all hope that we emerge from this with a high quality, affordable, sustainable healthcare system. I do think that financial crises sometimes force conversations that are difficult to have. And I hope some of those conversations are around right sizing some of the hospitals. And I think this amplifies this financial crisis that we're in amplifies the need for sustainability plans and service line optimization and looking for opportunities for efficiency gains. So I know today's meeting is not the topic of those sustainability plans, but I would like to, you know, put that on the agenda soon um, as we start to think about we are going to be getting these budgets in and it would be really helpful to be starting to move down the path of understanding how the hospitals are going to um, see a path for themselves for sustainability. So those are my comments, and I guess my question was largely 
Patrick, about a mid-year adjustment and how you see that being operationalized. Yeah, so from my perspective, which is outsider looking into a hospital, um, I think it's doable. However, I don't want to um, say that with a, a bunch of certainty because I don't know what goes into the um, having to make the changes to all of the charge masters and uh, schedules and whatever. So I guess there I would probably ask the folks at Vaz if they could reach out to some of the hospital financial leadership to see if that's operationally something that can be done with uh, relative uh, ease. And <clears throat> that really does go back to the fact that not knowing um, all of the work that goes into changing that or the negotiations with the insurers, I think we'd want to hear some feedback on that first. Okay, thank you. Okay, Robin. Yeah, and just to finish off that conversation, my recollection from a few years ago is that Rutland actually came in with a mid-year charge reduction because they were running hot and they were trying to stay on budget. So I think it's at least theoretically possible for some hospitals. Um, so I agree with with us trying to get more um, feedback on that in terms of uh, from hospitals and also from the insurers. That would be helpful to know their perspective as well. Um, so I, uh, I first of all, I, I want to thank the team. I think they did an excellent job of summarizing the discussions that I had with them and uh, that Maureen had with them around different factors um, to be weighed. And so I feel like um, I feel pretty comfortable with having uh, kind of the factors spelled out in the guidance so that it allows for hospitals to kind of make their case and also for us to consider hospital by hospital specific uh, information. Um, I do think um, folks made some good suggestions for some additional considerations that we could add. That's all I have. Thank you, Robin. So it's clear that we have a, a lot of decision points. And let me try to um, start a framework where we can start to make some decisions and have discussions about different uh, topics. So first of all, um, let me start with the most recent option, which was proposed to us this morning from Vaz about um, not having the 21 budget um, process in place this summer. Is there any board member who would like to make an argument for that option? So by not hearing anyone make an, an argument, I'm going to assume that that option is off the table for now. Um, yeah, Kevin, I would just jump in to say that I'm not comfortable with that option because while I think Act 91 technically would give us the authority to do that, it was not an option that was discussed with the legislature and it's much uh, more aggressive in terms of a process than uh, the different examples that we've been using in the discussion to get that flexibility from the legislature. So part of my discomfort is that I feel like it goes a little uh, a, a step too far for um, sort of our rationale for getting that regulatory flexibility. Thank you, Robin. I share your concerns on that. And uh, I do think that now more than ever, um, as Jess said, um, we need to have plans towards sustainability, and this process is part of that plan to get everybody uh, on sustainable footing. So, again, uh, Kevin, can I just I just want to make one comment on it uh, as well, which is, um, you know, I'm not supportive of not having a process. I think we try to minimize the deliverables, and the hope would be that the meetings that we have with the hospitals in August. Um, in person or virtual that, um, you know, would be much more in conversation about what's going on. And probably one of the big concerns would be if there's no budget process, what does happen with the commercial rate increases that will be asked? Because we know typically they've told us it takes about 60 to 90 days to get that through and, and with the insurance companies, which is kind of ties in with that October 
time frame so that most of these insurance changes are Jan 1. Um, so I, I would just have a concern if there was no budget, what does that mean for what would be rolling through for commercial rate changes? So, um, uh, you know, I think we have tried to minimize what we're asking, but I'm not supportive of not having a process knowing that, yeah, the, the budget, well, there'll be lots of changes, the actuals to budgets will evolve every month and, um, you know, that's that's as expected and it will be more in flux for the next 18 months than historically it has been, but it, it's just a starting point. Thank you, Maureen. So I'm not hearing anybody uh, argue for that option. So at this point, we'll consider that option off to the side. Um, another, um, let's start to talk about enforcement. Um, I don't think we officially took a position on 2019. Um, I know I've argued in the past that I don't think there should be any enforcement um, for 19 or 20, but just for a simple, hopefully simple discussion, um, would somebody like to make a motion about 2019 enforcement? I actually thought we voted on 2019 enforcement with the first time we looked at the guidance. I couldn't this find Mike. it anywhere. Maybe we did, but I couldn't find it. This is Mike. I, I believe you did. Good. <laughs> Wave enforcement for 2019. Okay. So moving to 2020, and again, I would use the uh, same argument that um, the way the 2020 guidance went out, um, if anything, the the biggest pieces of the enforcement would be on the downward side and nobody should be punished because they lost um, um, significant utilization due to, to the pandemic. So um, does anybody wish to make a motion on 2020? So 20, uh, just procedurally before we, I'm happy to make a motion, but before we do that, 20, we voted on a guidance document for 20, enforcement last year as part of the guidance. So um, I just don't yeah. want hospitals left hanging out there thinking that there could be possible enforcement for um, the 2020 budget year. That's where I'm coming from, Robin. I know that there's guidance that's already been out there, but that guidance specifically talks about the um, variations, both to the up and the downside. And I think it, it would give some comfort to hospitals to know that they're not going to have to deal with enforcement for 20. Yeah, I'm not sure I support the urgency of, of doing that right now with, you know, to, we can look historically at what we've done for guidance for enforcement and there has not been a lot, you know, a lot of actions that have been done. Um, so I, I wouldn't assume that there would be much done for or anything done for enforcement at the end of the year, but why give up that up now when something could happen as unlikely as it may be that um, would create a situation where there maybe should have been enforcement. So, so that's my only thing is I, you know, I, I think we've been, I think we've been fairly reasonable on how we've looked at enforcement. I'm not saying at all that I'm going to be trying to enforce unreasonably. I just don't understand. I, I don't support giving that up at this point. I don't see the benefit. I don't I don't perceive that hospitals are worried that we're going to be enforcing them in 2020 when most of them are probably going to be losing a lot of money. But should for some reason there be a windfall in what they're given for um, stimulus funds and a hospital that we're saying now has has come back and all of a sudden they exceed significantly. Again, very unlikely. Why are we even bringing that up right now? That's that's my point of view, and I know it's just one point of view, but I I don't see why that's even an issue at this point. I think it's hey, let's move forward with 21. I don't know why we need to talk about it, but. Well, Kevin, I'll jump in here. I, uh, I support waiving enforcement for 2020. I think so many things happened, obviously, beyond anybody's expectations or any way in which they could have planned ahead for a 100-year pandemic. And I think it's a very unlikely event that 
any hospital generates such an incredible windfall that they exceed their NPR, you know, budget for that year. If that happens, I think we can deal with it in the next budget year, um, which would be, you know, six or eight months later after the time period under which we would be doing enforcement anyway. So my sense is, you know, to just take one thing off of the table is to not enforce a budget that no way could possibly have been, um, you know, actualized. Yeah, I just want to add one other thing. When I've looked at enforcement in the past, it hasn't always been just on the upside. It's been on the downside as well. And and those are the hospitals that actually may need more, um, I don't know how to phrase, not guidance, but, you know, may, may need more in those types of situations. And, um, you know, obviously all the hospitals are acting in what they believe is their best interest, but, it, you know, there could be, could be, you know, a hospital that is making bad decisions because they're down so far. So, uh, you know, and, and I know we could still have them review things and other things, but I, you know, but again, I've spoken my piece on it. I, I know I think everyone's going to be at a different position, but I think enforcement is both on an upside and a downside. Again, to protect the interests long term of the hospital solvency. Um, as, as being one of the underlying you know, things that we're looking at. I'm uh, I'm support I'm kind of where Jess is on this. I'm I support uh, uh, not having um, enforcement in on the 2020 budget, and I think that as we move into 2021, if there's something that happened in 2020 that is along the lines that Maureen might be talking about, we can deal with it. Uh, deal with it then. I mean, we're, we're, you know, this is a continuous process um, and it's not just one year. And uh, so I, I would rather take it off the table now for 2020, not have hospital worry about it, but know that if, if something does happen in 2020, uh, that, that we can deal with it in the 2021 process or 2022 process. Thoughts, Robin? Uh, well, I was trying to pull up the guidance because I didn't go back and read the enforcement from last year's guidance, um, which makes me a little bit uncomfortable <laughs> waving it because I haven't read it. <laughs> um, Keep in mind that anything that we do vote on would be tentative anyways. Yeah, I mean, I certainly... I, I don't want hospitals to worry about it, and I do think it's unlikely meaningful enforcement would happen. What I just haven't thought through yet is that there is people are assuming that they can then fix that in 21, which may be, but I think waiving the, if it's clearly related to 20, I just need to think about the legal part of that. Like, I don't know if Mike has any I, thoughts. I, I do have a, I think one of the things that I heard Kevin say was basically enforce two years worth of budgets together, right? So 20 and 21 combined enforcement, at least that's how I'd understood it. So I'm also a little bit concerned about waiving enforcement for 20 when really it's kind of like a combined enforcement for two budget years. That's potentially on the table, if that makes sense. I understand what you're saying, Mike, but I think that the point I was trying to make was not to have um, the enforcement be for two years. The enforcement is really for 2021, but only um, if they've exceeded um, the two years plus a, a growth rate. And um, so I, I didn't really consider that to be 2020 enforcement. I guess you could try to make an argument that it could be. Well, I was trying to take easy decisions off the table, but sometimes they're not always that easy. Um, so. uh, I, I think conceptually I'm I'm on board with what you're saying, but just legally I want to make sure that we frame it in the right way. So um, maybe what makes sense is for the legal team to take a look 
and I'm happy to look too at the night at the 20 guidance and then think about whether that it's a waiver we're talking about or whether we can frame either make retroactively amend the 20 guidance or frame the 21 guidance in such a way that it encompasses the two years. Um, I think there are ways to get to the same result. I just want to make sure that whatever we vote on is consistent with legally what we would need to do to cross our T's and dot our I's. So we'll put that discussion off till next Wednesday. And Robin, if you could work with the legal team to I explore will. those options, that would be great. So that gets us to um, 2021 enforcement. I've thrown out an idea out there. Do others have other ideas? I know there's one option is what is actually written in the current guidance that, that has been uh, put out there for comment. Um, this, the second option is the one I proposed, which is to um, add 20 and 21 together and uh, add on an additional 3.5% for 21. Um, and then um, put the enforcement in that time frame, in that uh, financial frame. But do board members have other thoughts and ideas? Um, yeah, I, I have one. I mean, I, I like the concept of that. Um, I guess the question I would have is, when do we have to align on 2021? Um, and the reason I bring that up is, is an example could be that many of the hospitals don't even come close to um, hitting that target, um, and that might be okay. Um, but so 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 if their budget, uh, I'll give the example of if we had a hundred million dollar hospital and this year they're at seventy five, and then next year they could be as high as 125, 126 if you want to be able to have that two year combined three and a half percent. And if they're significantly, if their budget is 112, um, and so there's no way they would even hit that cap, um, but that might be okay. I'm just throwing out, you know, then there's, you know, then there's not even any chance we would look at that. And then what with, What if within that year um, they they far exceeded that number and it all dropped to profits? I'm just throwing out examples. I, I have, you know, I do like the concept of it. I'm just saying we might not even be close for any of the hospitals to be able to, to hit that number. That might be okay. I just want everybody to think about that, that um, because of this hangover where, even if there wasn't COVID, people might not come back. We we may not even get close to those numbers. Um, and we could say, okay, that's fine. It's still under the three and a half percent caps, but then we're not, you know, not even really looking at what they're budgeting for this year necessarily. So I, I, I like the concept. I just wanted to throw that out so people could think about that as well. Other thoughts from board members? I like the concept. I don't have any any uh, different ideas. Um, uh, just to Maureen's point about the when, I think typically we've tried to publish the enforcement policy at the same time as the guidance so that the hospital would understand what the potential enforcement is going into their budget submission. So it gives them uh, due process for that. So uh, I think that's, I think it is still a good idea to try and uh, do an enforcement policy that is different than what we've so far put out there. Um, and then we should think about what you said, Maureen, in terms of whether uh, we somehow incorporate that in some way. Yeah, and I, I guess another thing that just to think about is um, how it ties potentially to to the commercial rate discussion and making sure we're maybe clear on that because if um, if again utilization wasn't going to really come back that much and we're giving this combined two year three and a half percent um, you could have a really large commercial rate increase of 20 25 percent you know a really big number 
because that would then offset some declines that you had received from um, Medicaid and Medicare and still fall within the three and a half percent for two years. So I just just we, I think we just make need to make sure, you know, that we're not um, giving different messages, because if, if you were to say this is the number you can be at and utilization is only going to be up, you know, five percent, but I was down 25 percent this year. That, that could potentially lead to a really large commercial rate that they may request, not necessarily approved, but, and then they come in and say, but we, you said I could be at this number. So just, just another thing to think about. Well, I think in that way, if we had an ability to do a mid-year adjustment, then if the volume is coming way back, then that commercial rate would have to come down in the middle of the year, right, to make sure that they're actually going to, I mean, I think that they're leaving us an option for looking in the middle of the year um, at what's happening. I mean, I think I just think of this as, in general, so much uncertainty. And what we're just trying to do here is do build some guardrails, some a, a framework. Um, but you know, as as you always say, Maureen, you know, budgets are pretty much obsolete the day that they're submitted and the ink is dry because so much changes, and they're the best estimates that people have at the time that they're making them. And so. I think we're just offering a framework, which I think, Kevin, I think works. I think we're going to probably find that there's going to be some uh, things that we have not foreseen in how, in how we're developing this. And that's why I like the idea of looking mid-year and having that ability to toggle and adjust if, if we need to. Um, but in general, I'm supportive of this notion of sort of over a two-year window um, allowing the hospitals who did not come anywhere close to the three and a half that were in their budgets for this year to recoup some of that next year with pent up demand and still keeping within a, the target that we've set for the state. Um, but I think that mid-year adjustment may be helpful if we can think about that. So I think what I'm hearing is that um, a good possible approach to move us uh, forward on this conversation would be to ask both the finance team and the legal team to work together to draft something this week on those two issues, one being um, mid-year adjustment process and the second being the um, enforcement process based on that 3.5% uh, um, uh, calculation that was laid out, and then have them um, post it online and send it to board members so that we could definitely get public comment within the public comment period. So the, the goal would be to try to have those two changes to the guidance um, out by Friday. Patrick and Michael, is that doable? Um, speaking for legal, I, I think so. Patrick, I'll be I, agree. I agree. Okay. Can, so, Pat, uh, Kevin, can I add one thing that maybe perhaps could also be put out there for public comment um, related to this, which is the COVID adjustment. We the the hospital team put a list together of the possible factors that hospitals should consider as they're estimating what that COVID adjustment might be, that temporary COVID adjustment. Um, I think we should put that list out there for public comment um, and adding a couple of the things that were discussed today. So, Josh, you're jumping out in front because that's going to be the next conversation oh, about sorry. changing charges. Um, Perfect. Sorry. I'm trying to knock out a couple as we go and then uh, um, move forward and also give the public an opportunity to comment today, um, but also to make sure that they know that they have the ability to uh, comment up until 10 a.m. next Wednesday. And again, Wednesday, before any votes would be taken, we would throw it open to the public. So um, could I get a uh, – is that okay with all the board members that we have the staff work on those two areas, post them, send them to us, send it out to the broad world so that we can get the comment? Does any, anybody object to that, uh, that effort? Nope. Perfect. So hearing none, we will get to that. What I thought probably would be the most difficult part of the discussion, um, which is the bifurcated uh, change in charge. And so let's 
let's take this in two separate pieces. Um, is there anyone who does not believe there should be a two-part bifurcated change in charge? If so, could you make your arguments now? So I'm not hearing any argument, so I'm going to go ahead with the conversation about the two parts of the change in charge. Um, one part would be the permanent change. And um, what I asked staff to do was to go back and do a five-year CAGR on what the system-wide change in charge has averaged over the last five years. That came out to 2.8%. Um, so I'm hopeful that the base um, target cap for a change of charge is somewhere around 3%. And that obviously, just like any change in charge that we have considered over the last multiple of years, each hospital would be able to make um, a plea and tell their story about why they might need a higher change in charge, um, but to know that um, going in where our thoughts are on that base part of the component, um, I thought we should have that discussion and throw it out there. So um, just throwing out where I'm at, I'm, I'm at uh, around the historical average or a little bit above, which would put us around 3%. I just wanted to get feedback from other board members on that base component. Anybody can jump in. <laughs> so I'm going to start calling off names in alphabetical order because we do need to um, continue to progress if we're ever going to uh, reach our goal of finishing this up by a week from Friday. So in alphabetical order, I guess that would be Jessica. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I support the idea of a permanent uh, you know, when we say permanent baked in going forward, the change in charge, um, I think that your target seems reasonable given what we've always done. I don't know, and I think hospitals will have to tell us, and we can certainly, you know, research this ourselves, but how has medical inflation changed as a result of COVID? So are supply shortages driving those prices up? The fact that the workforce shortage may be lessened because there's more uh, supply available, maybe that's putting a less utilization, maybe there's less need for temporary staffing. I mean, there's a whole bunch of factors here that I don't know how COVID affects expenses going forward. So I would want to learn a little bit more about that. But in general, I think that, you know, your target area without that information sounds reasonable. So I think that's where the hospitals might make a case if they have some particular, uh, you know, new information on medical inflation as it pertains to COVID. Uh, and getting, you know, how has that affected supply chains and things like that? Thank you, Jess. Robin? So, um, one of, I think one of the worries that I have about setting a specific number is that um, using a historical number doesn't factor in that COVID will still be here for fiscal year 21. And the, the temporary chart change as we've discussed temporary COVID change in charge as we've discussed it was backwards looking in terms of making up for for reduced utilization in the past, not necessarily adjusted for what is our best guess about what happens in 21. So um, so I don't I don't have a number in my head, but that would be my worry about using a three percent is that uh if we come to August and we think that COVID, you know, we see there's another COVID outbreak and that utilization is down and looks like it will be down, you know, for several months in fiscal year 21, and we know that, like, that 3% may not be the right number. So I just, I don't know how to think about it in that sense. Thank you, Robin. Tom? Well, I, I think that it's 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 good to have a guardrail, and three percent um, is a fine number with me, as long as there's some language that uh, 
that uh, gives the message that hospitals uh, could, uh, that the door is still open for discussion uh, for hospitals that may need more. Um, I, I still worry about the kind of chronic disease that our system has in terms of payer mix, and some hospitals are um, you know, better situated than others, and I would just want to make sure that if a hospital feels um, that uh, that guardrail of 3% is, is too constraining, that, uh, that the door is open for um, a, an enhanced discussion. Kevin, may I just ask you, do we need to put a number on this? I, w I thought you were kind of throwing this out there as just your general feelings, but do you actually want in the guidance to be a number on the base for the commercial rate? So um, it's not something that um, I necessarily want, Jess, but it, it's something that I thought that the board had decided at a previous meeting that they wanted to put actual guidance in on the, the charge. And so if the board decides that they don't want to put a number in, but just uh, a narrative about that, I'm okay with that. But I, I was interpreting what that previous um, decision from the board was that they wanted um, some better language on change of charge in the guidance, and that's why I was pursuing that. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I'll just say for me personally, I like the idea of a two-part charge, but I, I'm not sure that I'd put a number on either part, and I think I would just say, uh, you know, let the hospitals put forth what they think their base charge increase would be as we do in any other year, justify it, and then put their part two COVID charge that we, that we are saying is going to be temporary and then justify it. So I'm not, but I, I guess that's what I would say. So sorry, I think Maureen hasn't spoken yet. I jumped in. That's okay. <laughs> Maureen. Now you articulated perfectly what I was going to say as well, which is we have not typically given a, a specific rate for commercial and, um, you know, I think looking at the, the past and that the five years has been at the 2.9%, I think, though, you know, if we were to go that route, I would have wanted to go deeper. What has each hospital done? Some hospitals have had negative adjustments in prior years that brought their numbers down. Other hospitals have averaged higher. So, you know, as we Your kind call of is very through, important to us. Please stay on the line, and your call will be handled in the order it was received. So whoever that is, if you could move your line. <laughs> yeah, I guess I, oh, I'm no. going to have to do it here, and then each individual speaker is going to have to hit star six, unfortunately. Um, so let me figure out. I had this figured out once earlier, and let me figure it out again. I think Abigail had sent some instructions. Can All of our representatives are assisting other callers at this time. Okay. Your call is very. Okay. So can you anybody hear me now? Yes. yes. Good. Yeah. Okay. So I think I've successfully muted whoever that was. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and if you're not listed as um, one of the presenters, if during um, public comment you wish to uh, uh, comment or speak, star six. So, um, or actually you probably could just unmute yourself if you're on Skype. Um, but, okay, so who was speaking? <laughs> so I was speaking. So, so really I just think as well just maybe putting some descriptions in the narrative but not putting a specific number, particularly this year since um, – uh, you know, as we've always said, it's not really one size fits all. And I think just trying to put one number in there when if we looked at each of the hospitals, their five year CAGR would be different. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I, I don't support putting in a hard number, but I do support the having, you know, a, two components when they come in for their budget, one being the kind of permanent um, rate increase and the other being the COVID temporary. Yeah, and in case I created the confusion last week, I, being a lawyer, in my mind, guidance are, is words and criteria and factors, not necessarily a number. So I hadn't, I hadn't meant to say I thought we should target a specific number, just that 
I thought we should put some factors in for people to think about. And I think Patrick's team outlined that those well in their presentation. Okay. So when you go to the words, Robin, would it, um, would those words say something that the, the, the base component would be more directly linked to what has historically been a hospital's change in charge um, and not that piece as it relates to utilization from um, COVID. And um, again, we've always told every hospital to tell their story um, so that there have been um, accommodations. Would you put any of that wording in or how would you phrase it? So I think in the, um I actually started working on a draft with the with the teams um, earlier this week, and uh, I think the way it's currently we currently started working on it was to have the COVID component be a description of um, the temporary increase linked to um, reduced utilization from 20 but that the factors were basically would apply to both components so that when we were looking at either the permanent or the temporary, we would be looking at a multitude of factors like we always do, right? We're always looking at the charge versus utilization, how it rolls up to the NPR. We're always looking at what's the hospital's financial situation, what are their specific circumstances? So that's, um, did you have some very clear language that the base component should not contain um, anything that um, relates to recapturing a lack of utilization from COVID or anything like that? Uh, not yet, but certainly, you know, it's a work in progress based on today's discussion, so it would need to change anyway. How quickly could that be ready for prime time so that that could be shared with the public, posted on the website, and uh, had public comment on? Well, I would defer to Mike and team, but I think since we have this part that we're actually partway done with, it could go out on Friday with everything else. But uh, Mike, does that seem doable to you? Yeah, yes. Okay, so I think what I've heard from the majority is that they would prefer um, not to have a specific number. Does anybody want to make one last pitch for a specific number? So hearing none, I think that um, the staff has the uh, charge of what uh, is being sought for and some proposed language that can go out to the uh, public for comment. So now let's get to what I envisioned was the hardest part. It may be the easiest part because sometimes it's very hard to predict what will be an easy conversation and what will be a hard conversation. But let's start to focus on the second part of the change in charge. And this time I'll go in reverse alphabetical order, um, just to give Jess a chance to uh, breathe. And Maureen, if you could go first with your thoughts on what you would like to see in the second part of the change in charge. So you are I'm, muted. Not, I'm not hearing you, Maureen. I'm on mute. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, I think the, the page that Patrick um, kind of outlined with um, uh, the specific things we would be looking for, I don't think, I'm not looking for a hard number for, uh, for this piece. And it's going to have to be very much supported um, with assumptions of the hospitals on what this is based on, so looking at right loss of commercial revenue um, as as the starting component, recapture of utilization in fiscal 21, um, the stimulus funds to date and projected, um, I think should be addressed, but I also think in, in context of the commercial rate ask, Right here, we're talking about separating it from commercial revenue and not including Medicaid and Medicare to make that amount up. So I'm thinking that the money that they get from the stimulus is 
most likely going to need to be applied to the loss that they had for those two pieces. So we would want to know about that um, and know if any of those funds are being offset to commercial. But um, that, in my mind, is not a requirement. So I, I think it's, you know, they can have it out there as what their assumptions are. Um, and then things on the next page as well, which incorporated, um, you know, the expense reduction, you know, kind of when, when I think about the long term strategic and financial plans, um, you know, were they looking at this as recouping everything in a year or was this over multiple years? Um, because I'm not. I don't know the specifics enough if, if a hospital was even trying to recoup this all in a year. What we have seen in the past is when they take a charge increase, it is also not, it is often not across all of their services. So they may only do hospital based services and not physician based services. And if there's some limitation as to why they need to do that, it could be huge numbers of what they would be increasing certain services by. So, so they may find themselves limited in how much they can increase in a year or would want to increase in a year and want to do it over multiple years. So I, I think the understanding the multiple year factor um, is important too. Um, so, you know, right now those are the variables I would have that should be considered in their request. Thank you, Maureen. Um, Tom. Um, I think that the uh, it should be kept as simple as possible um, in terms of you know what is clearly COVID related, and you know, and and I think Maureen makes a good point that it it could be a multiple year um, uh, profile, but uh, I you know I, I worry that the language is so general that hospitals will be putting a lot of things in there. And so the guardrails around uh, what what should be included, um, and I think, you know, on, on the previous slide um, is, uh, is, is, is pretty clear. And, uh, but even there, you know, when you get into payer mix, you know, what about Medicare and Medicaid? There's a lot of uh, integration of that concept with uh, what is happening now in terms of, uh, the COVID experience. So, um, you know, um, less is more, I think, here. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Robin. Um, yeah, no, I think um, I'm aligned with where Maureen is. I think um, it has to be, and Tom too, I think we're all, it sounds to me like we're all pretty much on the same page, that we need to have considerations, but a lot of flexibility, both for the hospital to make their case and for us to take all the different factors and whatever information we have or don't have available at the time. So I think um, that's good. On the change in charge, I would just um, mention that I think what we learned in some of our previous um, reports around rates is that the change in charge typically only applies to inpatient and outpatient hospital services. The physician uh, dollars are on a fee schedule, so those are not impacted by uh, any decisions we make around change in charge. So um, just when we are thinking about the impact, that's a good thing to remember. Good point. Okay, Jessica. I don't think I have much more to add. Um, I think the time dimension will be important to understand over which time period they're thinking of applying this. Uh, I think it's important for us to understand how, if there's any, you know, the federal and state stimulus funds, in my mind, should apply, should offset losses from all three payer types, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. Um, it would also be helpful to understand any assumptions they're making about increased reimbursement, reimbursement adjustments to offset losses that are coming from Medicare and Medicaid. So we have all of that information. Um, and then to the degree that I, I just mentioned this earlier, but what is the impact on bad debt and free care that they're assuming this increased commercial rate might have? So that's, that's it for me. And I think, you know, letting the hospitals do their calculations to make their best assumptions. And let's see what it is, see what it looks like. Okay. 
So I'll put in my two cents. I think I'm the only one, so I'm definitely in the minority that would have put a formula out there for the calculation for the individual hospitals, only because I worry that um, there could be uh, a question of fairness and it just puts more pressure on the Green Mountain Care Board to get to the bottom of this uh, component. Um, if there isn't a firm formula, and what I had suggested is a formula that uh, basically calculated um, the loss of um, commercial revenue and um, was a way for them to um, get that back so that we're not, we're not pushing the system boundaries because as everybody knows, it's, it's really a function of price and utilization. And it was an attempt to um, create sustainability by um, having a, a short-term price increase um, that would be durational in length and, and would allow that. And I think that's, everybody's still saying that, but I, I do worry that by leaving it um, up to the hospitals, if there isn't, a strong formula put in place that we could see some very wide ranging proposals on the second half of this. Um, I guess that doesn't truly scare me because I think we have um, the financial acumen to get to the bottom of that. I just thought it might be more helpful if we were more um, upfront with what we expected, but I, I can live with it clearly. I'm one of five, and I didn't hear anybody else uh, supporting that. So with that, I think that um, the charge, again, would be for the legal team to um, draft language that um, puts in place the um, assumptions that Maureen laid out and um, allows for them to make that pitch. And so, Mike, could you also have that by Friday, now that we're asking for such a lot? I anticipate, yes. I, I mean, we can uh, huddle with the hospital finance team today and tomorrow and hammer out some language, and um, I think that's possible. Okay. So, um, board, what are the other open items at this point? What am I missing here? Anyone have anything? Um, I think yeah. the one one potential I, uh, open item was: Do we want to talk about? Um, you know, we had previously put the three and a half percent in for this year as for 2021. I know we've talked about enforcement being a combination of the two years. Um, uh, most likely that three and a half percent if if we went on that theory that we we thought hospitals might be low in 20 offset by higher in 21 then most of them could conceivably come in with requests significantly higher than three and a half percent um for the year so so i know it's you know when we're looking at the two year it kind of narrow comes together but you know, again, in that example of a hospital that's at 100 that's coming in at 75 this year, under our enforcement, they could come in at 125 next year, which would be a 25% increase over NPR. I'm not saying that will be the request, but clearly they could come in at 110, 115, 120. And, and so I think that 3.5% in there is meaningless for what we would potentially would get for 21 submissions. Um, so I, that, you know, I know we've gone back and forth. Do we put nothing? Do we put something? You know, and, and maybe there's some somewhere in between. I don't have the answer for what it is, but I think that was one of the open uh, issues. Well, this so is again, the only reason why I had been uh, pushing for that is that uh, we would expect hospitals, if things go well, and if people are willing to go back to um, hospitals for their medical care and we don't see second, third, fourth waves, that um, it would just be a, a, a one-year 
opportunity for hospitals to blow through um, their NPR. And so that's why I suggested just using the 3.5% above the 2020 um, NPR, um, knowing that nobody's going to be enforced um, unless they really go um, above their the the 103.5 percent plus um, whatever um, drop in utilization they saw in 2020. So that's why I had thrown that out there, but I'm willing to entertain any other ideas. So we, we could put something similar in the guidance for the year, which which would be, um, you know, a three, you know, so, something about that multi-year. I mean, that could be the, some, in the guidance as well, right? So rather than having it be 3.5%, it would be the cumulative from your 19 budget to your 20 budget to your 21, um, adding 20 and 20, you know, it would be the same thing as enforcement in reverse. I mean, we, we could incorporate that potentially, which would probably be more meaningful than just saying it's 3.5%. Or as you said, you know, you just keep it. If we put it in there at three and a half percent, it probably. I'm just worried, Maureen, that people will think that whatever that budget number that you give them for the NPR is permanent, and that they can work off of that in the future. And that's that was my fear, and 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 why I put out what I put out. So I, th I think that uh, that section of the written document needs to be consistent between with the enforcement policy because the enforcement policy is Appendix 5 to the document. So it's all one document. So um, I think that when legal go, goes to work on it, they will see that they will need to change the language that's currently in that section in order to be consistent with the enforcement policy. So I, I think it will end up it should probably end up reading something more like what Maureen was saying. Otherwise, we have a conflict in our document. Well, and I also think if you if we roll it forward, so so if we go all the way out to 2022, um, so again, I'm using that 100 million example. So this year they come in at 75. I'm just going to be extreme for illustrative purposes. Next year they come in at 125. The following year we would expect them to be about 107, right? So that, that would be the 3.5%, you know, each year. So it's a decline from 21 to 22 of a, of a fairly big number. So we're not going to want to have 3.5% in there per se that year. It's kind of this, you know, again, we're trying to predict a lot of things, but if we said next year's was a temporary um both a temporary rate change and a temporary utilization increase for the loss utilization this year, then the following year would go down. So I'm just trying to think about it going forward too. So that year we wouldn't want to put three and a half because that three and a half would be, you know, would generate 130. Well, that's exactly the point that I was trying to make that um, they need yeah, to know. Yeah, that's why we wouldn't keep three and a half percent in this year. It's the same. They're going to expect what my expectation is if we just plug in three and a half every year, then why wouldn't we do it the next year? If, if we know this year won't be three and a half, if we believe that they'll get some utilization and put a hefty commercial rate in, why not put what put something in there? And then the next year it goes down. It's creating a, a, a floor for the 22 discussion. That's the only reason to put it in there is it creates what um, we'll be talking about for increases for the 22 budget. Um, because if you um, don't put some language in there, and I think that we're kind of saying the same thing, but we're going about it a little bit differently. But I think if you don't put some language in there, we're going to have problems with people's interpretation of what their base is for 22. Um, and I think at the end of the day, we're coming about it to the, the same point. The only slight correction that I would say to you, Maureen, is it wouldn't be um, a straight um, 107 because there's, there would be natural compounding. No, I know, but my point is it would be that, like this, you mean for 2022? Correct. Right, 2022 would have been 2020, 20, if we started at 100, 
right? Then 2021 should have been 103, and then 2022, right? 1.035 is 103.5 times 1.035 is 107.1. So it would be 107. But what we're really thinking will happen is it'll be 75, 125 to 100, and then 107. So the 107 right. divided by 100. So you actually. You that's what I'm give. agreeing with you on. It doesn't matter how it gets worded as long as it's understood by hospitals that um, a component, if you want to go the route that you're talking about, say the hospital lost the 75, made 75 and lost 25 of the 100 that was proposed for this year. So you're giving them a budget for 125 um, plus the, uh, the growth factor for next year. Then um, as long as there's some language in the guidance that reverts it back to that base, which at that point would be the uh, um, 103,500,000 for that um, hospital um, example scenario. So I, I don't, to, in my mind, it doesn't make a difference which way you do it, whether you do it through what you're proposing or what I'm proposing, as long as it's clear in the guidance that in the end, um, the component that is above the, um, call it the, the, the 103,500,000 example would, um, would revert back to that for the following year. Yeah. And I think, you know, luckily we only have 14 hospitals and I think they're all run by smart management people and I think they'll understand this concept. So, you know, whether that year we actually would have said you have negative 15% year over year to if we kept to a budget to budget um, or something like that. But I think, yeah, I think we're saying the same thing. Uh, I'm just saying I don't think a 3.5% increase over their budget this year is really relevant under the conditions and I like what Robin's saying, which was kind of tie it more to what we're saying for enforcement. And then we can think by 2022, so much will have changed over all this COVID stuff. We'll either know, is it is it gone? Is it still here? What's going on? You know, which will impact what the rate would be, but what the percentage increase. Any other thoughts? Uh, can I just get clarification? So it, when we're writing this for Friday, the direction is to change the NPR amount now, not the enforcement. Is that the direction folks are going? I, I think that the enforcement part has to be changed and that the NPR has to be in alignment with that. I think that the enforcement part is the 3.5% the over the um, two years. Um, but whether you tie it to um, what Maureen has suggested with um, a dollar figure for um, 21 that gets a portion of which gets rolled back, or you do it as a percentage base, what I propose, I'm fine with doing it Maureen's way as long as at the end of the day, everybody's aware that they're getting back to that same base for the following year's budget. I'll talk to Mike about this, but we may have, because we can't really do two-year budgets, I think we may have to do it the enforcement way because then we are looking, uh, we're not prospectively setting two-year budgets, right? We're just talking about how we will enforce the way they roll through. Uh, but I need to talk to Mike and team about that. But why don't why don't we try to take a stab to, to get us there, and then, um, you know, obviously we'll get some public comment, and that might help us refine it. And um, yeah, and Robin, I don't think we're trying to do. I'm not suggesting we do a two-year roll forward. I'm suggesting that for 2020, 2021, sorry, that for 2021, we don't just put in three and a half percent over 2020. We put it in as as which we could calculate the number, but the 20, you know, the, it's really more off of the 2020 actuals compared to their budget plus plus the 20, the new 2021 number would be a number. And then I just gave as the example 
that in 2022, if nothing else happened and, you know, everything had kind of resumed, um, we would expect that there would be an inflated number in 2021 because of the utilization that didn't get happened in 2020 that moved to 21 and the temporary rate change that would create a situation where there would be a negative NPR budget to budget. But that we'll deal with the 2020, 2020, you know, in another year. I'm not saying I was just trying to be illustrative to say I have a concern about just keeping a three and a half because next year we wouldn't, I don't think, keep a three and a half in there um, because it would be off a very high number. So that's exactly the point. I think we're saying the same thing, Maureen, but I think that um, this can be drafted in a way that it's clear to people and um, it's almost in the same way then as I see it, the way you're proposing it, Maureen, the NPR for um, 21 would almost have two components, which would have a base and then the lost revenue from COVID component that would be allowed in addition to that. And at the end of the, the year, it would go back to that base. I think we're saying the same thing, but maybe we're not. Yeah, no, that's what it would be. But I, I didn't think that was expressed when we say an NPR of three and a half percent. So, um, which is what we had previously approved as the guidance. So, yeah. I, think, I think we're saying the same thing, but we're going about it differently. Okay, that's fine. So, Mike, do you have enough to take a stab at that? I think so. Patrick? You good too? I'll likely have some clarifying questions offline, but yeah, I'm good. So other than NPR and change in charges, are there any other parts of the guidance that a board member wishes to discuss? Hearing none, I'm going to throw it open to the public, and this is the beginning of your chance to um, really give us some strong feedback. And, um, you know, so please don't be shy. And uh, is there a member of the public who wishes to comment on the discussion they've heard and the proposed guidance so far? Kevin, this is Susan. Um, I did hear that for folks who are on Skype and not on a phone line, that they still may have difficulty getting in. So, so I will unmute the audience. Great. Mr. Chairman, this is Jeff Tiemann. If you're ready for me, I can comment. I am ready, Jeff. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I, I know that I'm not always the brightest bulb, um, but this conversation was a little hard to follow today. And, and I think it shows the complexities and the moving parts that we're all managing. And that's kind of a segue to the comment that I wanted to make, which was to provide just a little bit of context for the board and the people attending this meeting about the letter that we sent earlier today. And the reason we suggested in our letter to dispense entirely with the sort of routine or normal budget process is that it is predicated on an environment where assumptions and healthcare business planning strategies are applicable and reliable. In a normal budget process, we may not have perfect information, but we do have some reasonable degree of certainty and confidence in our assumptions. That is clearly not the case now, as I think this conversation even demonstrates. And I think the hospital budget process can't possibly account for the environment we're in and the difficulty it's created in predicting volume, revenue, uh, costs, special circumstances still to come, for example, a surge of patients or the need to curtail non-urgent procedures again. So it just occurs to me that carrying out the routine budget process right now is kind of like driving in a rainstorm. You, you sort of know where you're going, but it's really blurry and really easy to get off course, and it's much safer to pull over and just wait out the downpour. Um, the only specific comment I want to make, and um, my colleague Mike Del Treco might have others, um, is on the attestation requirement, which was also something we mentioned in our letter. Um, Act 91 does give the Green Mountain Care Board the authority to eliminate that requirement um, in the current situation, and we think you should. 
CEOs quite simply should not have to swear that the budgets um, they're submitting, which are pretty wild guesses at this point, um, what would um, would be totally and, and completely accurate, just given all of the the uncertainty. Um, so, all of that being said, I, I would like to express um, gratitude for for the board's work to simplify the guidance and and work through these hard issues. Um, and if you do, um, you know, it sounds like we're going to proceed with with the regular process. Um, and as that continues, Vos will certainly continue to react to. Um, the topics raised today on change of charge, NPSR cap, hearings, and so forth. So we'll be in touch as, as this continues to evolve, and thanks for hearing my comment. Mike, as a favor, could you um, forward to the board the uh, language that's in the attestation so that we could look at that and uh, possibly have a discussion on it next week? Yes. Thank you. Okay, other members of the public? Hello, Kevin. This is Mark. Mark Stanislaus. Mark. So, um, I too have had a challenge following these conversations, and particularly from the perspective on what does it mean to have a financially sustainable health system. And, and, and I think looking at it the way we've done it in the past is going to take what my personal belief is before COVID was on a, a very clear downward trend of being very clearly unsustainable. So we need to find a way to stop thinking about how we've done things in the past. And I would just like to throw some numbers out there and I'm referring to the total health system. In 2016, we had a margin of 3.9%. 2017, 2.7%. 2018, 1.1%. 2019, 0.7%. First quarter FY20, a loss of 0.5%. Okay? And there's been a lot of discussions about sustainable or impact and the impact on the commercial payers. And I have to throw out there, from my 25 or 26 years of professional modeling experience with hospitals and working with the radiancies multiple times. I mean, I've had 50 probably discussions with radiancies about financially sustainable. That trend is not financially sustainable. And I know we're talking about FY21 process, but I just have to get that comment out there. I just have to. Uh, um, and, 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 and so, you know, that's the backdrop in which my following comments are coming from, okay? So, you know, the financial performance was not good before. And, and you know, COVID just added to that. And, and, and there is a known that we have from the COVID. The hospitals and the providers in the state were called to action and they stepped up to action. And we were fortunate to avert the global health crisis, but all of the providers in this state stood ready and made investments with people, management, and staff. And, and you know, and without a financial sustainable system, you know, that readiness is going to be severely, severely um, um, uh, we know the expectation is going to be less and less and less. So, you know, I am very worried about this historical trend and carrying over the way we've thought about things in the past to the future. And, and so as I think about the future, we really need to make this about an ongoing conversation. We are not going to have any idea what the changes in the payer mix are going to be until three to six months into FY21. So, we, we, you know, trying to pick a number on a cap for FY21, you know, one, I think some understanding needs to put in there, you know, as Maureen 
we know put forth. We need to make this about an ongoing conversation. And the ongoing conversation needs to be not only how do we recover you know, from this, but how do we make a, a sustainable healthcare system? Because we really don't have one today. And you know, that's my personal opinion and I'm respectful of those that feel differently. But you know, we don't. Um, so, you know, from a cap perspective, um, you know, I do think you, if you have to have a cap, you have to factor in any difference in FY20 into that cap. Make the conversations only about FY21. It seems to me we're having a lot of conversations with F, about FY22, and we don't even know the um, the unknowns to complete FY20. So let's make the ongoing conversation about FY21. Um, and you know, from a rate perspective, um, um, it completely makes sense to split it into two distinctive components and not have you know limits on that. And you know, particularly on the base, because you know, if you look at that five-year average over that base, that's partly what led from that operating margin from a little under 4% to a loss year to date December. That simply isn't gonna cut it to create a sustainable system in the future. So, you know, um, I, I know that we need to work through a budget process. I know there's many connectivities to that, you know, budget process and, you know, s some of them are written in statute. So, you know, but I would stress, we need to make it about an ongoing conversation. We will need to learn how to adapt on the fly, both up, down, you know, um, and, 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 but part of that conversation needs to be about sustainability for these hospitals. I've heard in these conversations a lot of time about the commercial payers. We need to get back to sustainability about the providers because if there's nowhere to provide the care in this state, and, and the residents of Vermont have to continue to increase to get more care out of state, out of state, I can assure you that cost will be greater. So, you know, um, so what I can put out there, make it about an ongoing conversation. There are so many variables out there. And let's focus to FY21 because, you know, I mean, you know, we can't even get through FY20 now. So, you know, while I believe some of the discussion points about FY22, they are things that we are gonna to have to tackle at that point. I don't think now's the time that we need to have the answer to those. So, I mean, thank you for this consideration. Thank you, Mark. Other members of the public? Other members of the public? I just checked to make sure that it was still unmuted. It is. I didn't want anybody to be shut out. Um, so I'll just give it one more chance. Other members of the public for public comment. And again, um, written public comments will be accepted up until the 26th at 10 a.m. And there'll be another period of public comment at the board meeting on Wednesday the 27th. Um, so one more time, any further public comment? Hearing none, is there any old business to come before the board? Hello? 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 Yes? Hi. Um, hi. This is Susan Aronoff from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. And um, I was trying to get in for public comment. Certainly. Go so, ahead. Yeah. So I don't know if this can be captured in the budget process. If not, it could be captured somewhere. I think would be really good information. And it goes back to the um, prospective payments, uh, particularly those I just really want to speak about Medicaid. It's really the program of most interest to the um, Developmental Disabilities Council. So a lot's been made of you know the new attribution methodology and lots more people in for Medicaid. And so 
the prospective payments that went out, like, it's great that that provided a bit of a lifeline to our hospitals. But I keep wondering how, as a payer, Medicaid will be made whole, if ever, because Medicaid was paying all those per member per month and the admin fee and everything else that's gone out the door for services that, as we know, for understandable reasons, are not um, have not been provided. But at some point, you know, hopefully we, people will come back into the system and um, Medicaid will, you know, will have a, with everyone who's lost their insurance as a result of losing employment, no doubt will have, you know, perhaps a surge on Medicaid. So anyway, I'm wondering if there's a way in the hospital budget process that the hospitals can account for the payments received through the prospective payment system by payer for services that were not provided. Just like how much they received in their inbox because of the prospective payment system that we've heard so much about. So that would be my comment. And I will try to put that in writing between now and the due date, which if you could remind us all when that is, that would be great. So Thanks. The, the due date for written comments is Tuesday, the 26th at 10 a.m. And you'll still have an opportunity for oral comments at uh, Wednesday's board meeting. Um, keep in mind that um, we always take written comments into consideration, even if they're late. But if you want them to have a thorough and thoughtful review, it's much better to get the written comments in under the time frame that's there, which is the 26th at 10 a.m. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. Did I miss any other members of the public? Okay, so I'll call for all business again from the board. And I'm just gonna call on a board member to confirm that um, um, the system is still working. Um, Robin, could you just say a word? Hi. Thank you. So hearing no old business, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. And um, I believe, uh, General Counsel Barber, that this doesn't have to be a roll call because of, um, unless it's a non-unanimous vote, is that correct? That's correct. All in favor of adjourning signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you, everyone. Try to get out and get some fresh air. It's a beautiful day.